The purpose of this lecture is to introduce you to the concept of wireless sensor networks, uh, what they are, their applications, and the challenges uh, that they face in deployment. So wireless sensor networks consist of a collection of sensors that are distributed in an ad hoc manner. Ad hoc means that there is no uh, there, is, there is no centralized uh, the, the way the sensors themselves are distributed there's no centralized way it's a kind of uh, a peer to peer connection typically when you are using wireless let us say you have uh, 10 students that are connected to a wireless network you have one device which you call the router and this router is responsible for managing uh, all these connections okay so in an ad hoc network an ad hoc network for uh, for example on a on a windows computer you can have two windows computers which are communicating with each other so you have communication between two peers we call them peers and there is no centralized router that manages uh, that connection so th this is the concept uh, of also of a wireless sensor network the sensors communicate amongst themselves but there's no centralized router that manages uh, that communication so typically a sensor is sensing some sort of physical phenomenon or they are actually they are controlling some actuators to obtain to, to obtain a particular goal okay so the most wireless sensor networks for them to operate successfully we need to usually write protocols of the network communications algorithms of how they of how they cooperate etc but all that is beyond the scope uh, of this discussion the picture shows a typical application of a wireless sensor network. It is probably habitat monitoring. You have all these various sensors that are piled up. They're measuring something. Okay, some are inside the water, some are away from the water. We have a hub. We have a hub. They all communicate to that hub. That hub does not manage their communication the way a router does that hub is just a central recipient point and in technical terms we call that hub the sync node okay all these others are typically uh, the, the side nodes okay we can call them transmitter nodes if what they're doing is purely transmitting but you could you can see that the three the three nodes from uh, you can see that the three nodes at the left of the to the right the ones which are kind of forming a triangle those three nodes actually have what we call intercommunication. One sends and then it also receives. Okay, so in a wireless sensor network, we we don't have only transmitter nodes. We can have unidirectional transmission where we have the various sensor nodes all transmitting to one sync node. But it is also possible to have co collaboration. Okay, for example, we can have what we call a relay node. A node can be far away, uh, maybe 200 meters away, and the forest cover and the vegetation are preventing the signal from getting all the way to the hub so we could have what we call a relay node the purpose of a relay node would be to simply get the signal and trans because the relay node would be nearer to the hub and to also be nearer to the transmitter it could be within the line of sight of the transmitter and also within the line of sight of the hub so the purpose of that relay node would just be to get that audio uh, to, sorry to get that signal and move it over to the hub so we don't only have transmitter nodes. They could be transceivers. They could be sending data and also receiving data. They could even have their own localized storage. But there is always that central collection point in a wireless sensor network. So one fundamental difference between wireless sensor networks and typical ad hoc networks in general purpose computer systems is that in the general purpose computer systems, ad hoc networks use point-to-point -point communication. You have one computer communicating with another computer. It is also possible in a wireless sensor network. However, typically in wireless sensor networks, we use what we call broadcasting. Okay, So a transmitter usually sends out a signal, and this signal may be picked up by anyone who is authorized uh, to receive that signal. Okay, So it is rarely sent to, to, to just one uh, intended recipient. So typically you'll find that uh, if it's using a particular protocol, let's say IEEE 802.15.4, there are particular addresses that are reserved as what we call broadcast addresses. And if you program it to send to that address, 
all all the all the nodes in the vicinity which receive a frame with the broadcast address uh, receive that receive that frame they don't neglect it okay as opposed to using specific addresses where if a node receives a frame and it is not addressed to that node it rejects uh, that frame then the uh, wireless sensor networks are limited uh, by sensors limited by power energy and computational capability sorry there's a small error in there so the sensors are limited in power and in computational capability okay in where wireless sensor network we typically have tiny sensor we typically have tiny sensor nodes okay kind of like the ones that you saw earlier on earlier on today and they are consuming very little power but because of that they are also they also have very little computational capability as opposed to general purpose computers and also the sensor nodes do not have global ids okay typically computers have ip addresses that uniquely identify them in a very large network now sensor nodes are typically only identified within their own local network okay so you need another way of identifying a particular sensor node so we have uh, services which have come up you should go and look up six low pan the, the number six then the word law then pan okay in 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 six low pan for example they are trying to see how they can give how they can send ip packets okay over this ieee 802.15.4 protocol okay this is the protocol that has the likes of the bluetooth and the my and the zigbee so they want in in the internet of things they want even these sensor nodes to also have ip addresses but typically right now that is not a requirement these are the applications uh, we have environment monitoring especially well in uganda we have the umea ict project we are the pioneer group we are the first people in uh, eastern africa and probably the whole of eastern and southern africa to use wireless sensor networks specifically in environment monitoring on a very large scale we are planning to deploy about 70 automatic weather stations that use wireless sensor networks most of the other research work that has happened in africa they are just designing small small things which are proof of concepts okay we have military surveillance okay traffic control structure monitoring uh, structure monitoring military surveillance involves sending out you can have small tiny drones that are flying about which are unnoticeable and each of those drones is communicating with each other, with each other wirelessly traffic control i've already explained this structure monitoring we can have uh, small wireless sensor networks that are deployed alongside uh, beams in buildings that may be record vibrations over a prolonged period of time typically these are what we call ultra low power nodes okay they are usually given one battery which can take them for maybe five years and during those five years people are monitoring the the pressure profile or the vibration profile of that building and uh, the experts the civil engineers can can say uh, whether there are some parts that need reinforcement whether the whether the building is in jeopardy you know things like this in turkey they are being used for disaster management to detect earthquakes you know so you know an earthquake usually starts it doesn't come at once well at least in turkey turkey is under what we call i've forgotten the actual name but i think i don't know whether it was the earthquake belt or something like that okay but turkey is a very earthquake uh, prone region so what happens is that uh, they have wireless sensor networks deployed across various areas which have a high probability of getting an earthquake and when the earthquake is about to start these can be sensed uh, quite fast and then the signal sent over very fast to the management uh, offices maybe to start evacuations and, and things like this asset tracking simply involves things like vehicular vehicular tracking uh, wireless sensor networks would be a new uh, application in this in this area but uh, off the top of my head using wireless sensor networks in asset tracking would involve uh, let's say tagging a particular item let's say it's a parcel and you're sending it from uh, from one location to another and it's going to pass through very many areas let's say along the road there are going to be a number of receivers okay so as it passes uh, that place 
a receiver picks it up it, it's, it keeps on transmitting as it's on the road inside the vehicle the packets keeps on transmitting through its uh, sensor node and all these are picked up so you can easily know where the item has reached in real time okay as opposed to the current tracking system where you you can only know where a person has reached when it is at uh, when it is when it is at the a, a, a sorting station okay so if it's coming from los angeles to kampala it first goes to to jamaica you can only know that it has reached jamaica and when it has left jamaica you can't know where it is until it reaches the next sorting center which is maybe typically kenya so you wireless sensor networks instead permit you this would be used of course inside a country uh, and for small over a, a small location and not international tracking but they can tell you that maybe the item is now 15 kilometers away it's now 10 kilometers away so as it could be used for asset tracking in things which are expensive things which need to get to particular places in time let us say organs which are being donated you know uh, if it's let's say a liver or a kidney it has to spend a particular amount of time uh, outside etc etc so i uh, i can see uh, in asset tracking i can see that this would be a typical application uh, of wireless sensor networks okay tracking high value high value commodities all people perhaps okay this is something that can be explored then medical diagnostics and wearable devices i have already explained this 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 is the zebra net project in kenya enough said here i have already explained a lot about uh, how you would use it for example in tracking in tracking wildlife you can look it up traffic management is an interesting application i have already spoken about traffic lights however what about driving okay for example typically when you're on the road when you want to overtake a vehicle you need to know you you gauge how fast it's traveling and then you gauge how much distance you have to be in the opposing lane in the adjacent lane sorry and then you have to come back okay so when you are in that adjacent lane you have to really minimize the time that you are there so that you do not meet uh, an incoming vehicle now wireless sensor networks would handle this quite well if vehicles could uh, communicate if we would have uh, signals in each vehicle uh, on the road then it would be possible as you are attempting to overtake to know whether you're going to make it or not okay and you could probably get uh, a warning they wouldn't replace human beings of course but they would assist okay they would assist it's the same way a microscope enables a doctor to diagnose whether somebody has a bacteria or a virus okay it is a physician assisting device so these wireless sensor networks could also be driver assisting devices okay that help to give more information to the driver to manage particular traffic incidents uh, on the road so the design challenges of wireless sensor networks are there the first design challenge is power consumption power consumption is a very very major issue because sometimes you are going to deploy these sensor networks in areas which are hard to reach where post deployment visits are going to be extremely rare or they're going to be impossible okay if let us say you're deploying in the renzoris okay no one wants to climb there every now and then so it's going to be necessary for you to make sure you minimize the power consumption as much as possible so that the batteries can last for as long as possible heterogeneity is the opposite of homogeneity Ho if something is homogeneous it means it's uniform all through it's made of the same substance heterogeneity is the opposite okay sometimes you're deploying wireless sensor networks that are of different architectures okay let us say the manufacturer has stopped supporting a particular processor and you have to continue your project running a newer processor or a processor from a totally different manufacturer okay you may need the old devices to communicate with the new devices okay so heterogeneity is a problem not just in engineering but even in computer science when you're working with legacy systems and databases etc this is always a challenge so you need to be able to make them to collaborate okay even if they're using the same general level protocol there are usually some device specific differences that affect uh, this communication low bandwidth is also another challenge we need to send out as uh, uh, we need to send out as much information as possible using as little bandwidth as possible if you look at uh, if you look at the the the, the project the, the synchro that i showed you today we only use about 25 megabytes in a month okay and that is uncompressed data if it was compressed it would probably go down to maybe 5 uh, megabytes that would be sending out every month okay so 
bandwidth is expensive and reducing bandwidth also reduces the cost and you find that very many projects or whatever deployment is going to have a wireless network typically money is an issue and it has to be taken care of then we have large scale coordination this typically comes in in very large expanses if you're deploying a wireless sensor network let's say over the whole of kampala okay and the devices need to coordinate typically this is a challenge okay how are you going to pull off that coordination how many relay nodes are you going to need okay how are the buildings going to affect etc etc then we have what we call real time computation uh, typically th there are some sensor networks that are deployed in areas where it's where the data comes in extremely fast and it's continuously changing and their purpose is not just to collect the data but also to actually make a computation and give a result which can be interpreted some networks are deployed in, in volcanoes active volcanoes and you know they are continuously picking up data so remember these sensor networks are deployed with uh, limited computation ability so here designers need to make sure that the sensor network uh, that they are going to design uh, the architecture they are going to use okay the devices they are going to use they need to make sure that they're going to be able to handle the real-time computation of the particular application uh, that they have the operational challenges are those challenges that are faced once the wireless sensor networks has uh, has already been deployed we have the energy harvesting efficiency okay uh, how much how much energy are we really collecting from let's say the sun or from the wind that is going to power uh, the, these networks is it enough uh, how much of it are we actually storing okay the, the optimizing the energy storage is another operational challenge uh, have we selected the right battery technology anyway how is this battery technology going to survive in this environment okay communication and survivability in harsh environments if we are going to deploy it in an area which is extremely hot or in an area which is uh, extremely dense with trees and uh, or an area which is continuously raining communication is uh, important survivability i mean is the humidity in that place going to continuously affect the the, the contacts inside the processors you know are we going to have a lot of rust are we going to have uh, are we going to have terminals of these devices inside reacting with moisture to form oxides things like this these are all challenges that we have also met in uh, in our research work okay so all these are things that have to be looked into you don't just get a wireless sensor network and you deploy it anywhere okay the, the usually the environment in which you're deploying it has a very big impact okay on the network uh, itself the following is the definition of a mod read it this is a picture of the RS2 mod. The RS2 mod is from a company called Radio Sensors in Sweden. These are the nodes that we are using uh, in the Wimea ICT project. You can see that we have the, the microprocessor somewhere there in the middle. Then to the right hand side, we have the antenna, that, uh, that oval shaped thing with two lines in it that you're seeing, you know, where we have this uh, CE0700 written and then there are so many other things you know it has an i2c interface it has a, it has a, a, a serial interface then in the middle next to the processor that six pin connector is an spi interface so it's basically an rf enabled microcontroller it can do anything that another microcontroller can do but in this particular one also has rf capability it can send out that stuff okay so here is a question that uh, i need you to attempt okay here we have this is a lithium thionyl chloride battery one big advantage of lithium thionyl chloride batteries is that they have a lot of ampere hours stored in a very very small size the disadvantage is that they they are not rechargeable you can't recharge them okay and uh, well another disadvantage is that they are load drain application batteries load drain meaning that they for example it can only give you a current of about 200 milliampires continuously you can't get one ampere out of it okay but that is not a disadvantage for us this is okay because if we are using it to power modes which are consuming milliamps and microamps it means it is a very good uh, solution for us so this particular one in this image is 8.5 ampere hours 8.5 ampere hours 
As a reference, the, the battery in my car is 45 ampere hours, so you can, uh, you can try to gauge. And yet this one is just 2 inches by 1 inch. Okay. Now, let us assume the mode which I have just shown you on the previous, uh, on the previous slide, that mode consumes 17 milliampires during transmission and it consumes 80 milliampires when it is sleeping. Now, it transmits once a minute. In a period of 60 seconds, it transmits once, and that transmission lasts only 20 milliseconds. So I want you to calculate how many milliampere hours are consumed in that period of one minute. Okay, How many milliampere hours are consumed? And using that value, I want you to tell me how long this battery would power that mode for. I'll give you a small hint. You need to look. At, you need to consider something like average weighted current. You need to. You, you you need to. There's a calculation you need to use, which roughly looks like the way you calculate your CGPA. Because I am not giving you a uniform current consumption. I'm giving you a current consumption for a particular duration and a current consumption for another particular duration. So you're going to find what we call the average weighted. The average weighted current. Okay. So I need that answer.